Hello everybody, here is Tatiana Bazzichelli from the Disruption Network Club and I'm very happy to introduce this panel behind the, and this conference behind the mask we're still blowing during the pandemic. Uh, in the past days we have been inviting experts that have been speaking out uh, by denouncing abuses and wrongdoing in the course of the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. Um, we are now starting with a very important uh, panel, and so I'm very happy uh, to uh, welcome our speakers today. Uh, the panel is uh, Julian Assange, Repression, Isolation and Lockdown. Um, so uh, first I want to welcome uh, Sulet Dreyfus, Jennifer Robinson, Stefania Maurizzi, Felicity Ruby and Anda Myers. So the program of today, after this panel, uh, will follow with a workshop. Uh, we will have a workshop with Serena Tinari. So I also want to welcome everybody that is listening to uh, join us there and to uh, subscribe to the workshop. Um, the workshop is named Get Your Number Straight, Making Sense of Health Data. Uh, there are still some spots available, so you are welcome to join. I also want to thank uh, the founders uh, of the Disruption Network Club. You can see them uh, on the screen. Um, and uh, I also want to remember everybody uh, that uh, we have a chat uh, of the audience. Uh, and uh, you can ask uh, questions, so you can interact with us. Uh, and uh, um, you will have uh, the possibility to uh, tell us your stories, to send uh, also links to projects that you think are interesting. So please uh, uh, go on disruptionlab.org and uh, uh, interact with us through the chat. This chat is also very important because at the end of the panel, I will come back and I will report your questions uh, to the speakers. So also ask a lot of great questions. Now we enter into this panel that I'm very, very pleased to have because I think that it's extremely important to speak about the situation of isolation, persecution of Julian Assange. Uh, so at the Disruption Network Club, we really wanted to have specifically this conversation because we also feel that uh, there is a lot of silence and so around this story. We need to speak, we need to report, we need really to make our voice heard. Um, this panel is also following uh, uh, the streaming conversation that we had uh, last May. Um, it was uh, a conversation with Renata Avila, Rimas Geyer and uh, Joseph Farrell that was uh, related to the discourse of whistleblowing during the pandemic. And in a sense, it's also a conversation that inspired this panel. Uh, but uh, this panel is also focusing, as we know, on the specific uh, situation of Julian Assange. Uh, I'm not going into the detail of it because we have with us great speakers that will tell us everything around it. Uh, but because of also the silence of the press, I really wanted to mention uh, an initiative that I think is very important that has been done in the past. It's called Speak Up for Assange. And uh, uh, was uh, an, in an initiative that uh, invited journalists and people in journalism uh, to be part of a global statement uh, in defense of Julian Assange. So I want to start uh, this panel with uh, showing this uh, short clip about this initiative, and then I will introduce the moderator of today. We journalists around the globe express our grave concern for Julian Assange's detention in a high security British prison. And for the unprecedented espionage charges he faces in the United States. If he is extradited to the US, he could receive a sentence of 175 years in prison. This is the first time a publisher is being prosecuted for disclosing classified information. This, this is, is why I am speaking up, up in defense of Julian Assange now at this dangerous time. He's being prosecuted for the crime of revealing war crimes. It is a terrible miscarriage of justice. And as a president, threatens our journalist colleagues working all around the globe. Without WikiLeaks, we wouldn't know about the evidence of war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they see spying on world leaders and UN representatives, abuse and torture at Guantanamo and other sites, and much more. 
publishing classified information in the public interest is an essential part of journalism. Many of the media outlets we work for release these stories alongside WikiLeaks. If the US government can extradite Assange for this, it will clear the way for governments to criminalize any of us anywhere in the world. Who will be next? Journalists and publishers should be able to shed light on government wrongdoing without the fear of being jailed. We, journalists of many countries, demand that Assange be released immediately from prison. That the UK government and judiciary refuse to permit a politically motivated extradition. And that the US government drop the charges of espionage. What happens to Julian Assange could happen to all of us. Now I will introduce the moderator of this panel, Anna Myers. She is the executive director of the Whistleblowing International Network. She has worked in the field of whistleblowing for 20 years, advising individual whistleblowers, employer of all sides and sector, and, and national international policy makers. She is originally from Canada and was a deputy director of a publicity concern at work, now called Protect for nine years, and has worked at Group of States Against Corruption and at the Government Accountability Project in Washington, D.C. So thank you, Anna, for being with us. I leave to you the honor to introduce our great speakers today, and I will come back uh, at the end of the panel to send the question from the audience. So please remind to send the questions to us. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, everybody, for being with us today. Thank you very much, Tatiana. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I am so impressed with my panel um, that I uh, that I feel um, that we have just the world of expertise uh, at our fingertips here, and uh, I am looking forward to learning as much as moderating this incredible group. Um, as Tatiana mentioned, I'm um, the executive de director of a capacity building network for NGOs around the world who are working to support and protect whistleblowers, and we are are in a period of um, a battle over information that's been going on for a number of years and um, whistleblowers, journalists, the lawyers and NGOs that defend them, um, we're all sort of standing on the, the island that is the public interest and the public interest is under attack uh, and certainly the access to information that allows us to make appropriate decisions in the public interest. So I would like to, uh, without really any further ado, um, start to introduce our, our panelists. I'll do it one at a time. Um, and as I do, uh, they will um, uh, correct me if I've gotten anything wrong. And they will also be very welcome to add any elements of their biographies that are relevant to this discussion, um, and then asking them to make um, some statements. So we'll go through each of the panelists. And then afterwards, I will be moderating a discussion between them. Again, as I said to them earlier, I don't have no doubt that they don't need me to have a fantastic, uh, interesting conversation, um, but I will be uh, just directing some questions towards them. Uh, and then again, we'll have questions from the audience. So I'd like to start with Dr. Sulette Dreyfus. Um, she is a lecturer at uh, of, in the School of Computing and Information Studies at the University of Melbourne. Um, she is a frequent public commentator in the media on IT-related topics. Her main research areas are incredible, but her main research areas are in cybersecurity, hacking digital privacy and anonymity, the impact of technology on integrity systems, so whistleblowing, social media as a tool for language in schools. She also wrote the first mainstream book about computer hacking in Australia. Uh, I believe with Julian Assange, um, and she, which has been made into two different films. Um, on top of this, she works with civil society, nonprofit uh, NGOs internationally. Uh, Blueprint is for free speech is one of as an associate member of WIN, which we are delighted to have her as part of our circle of expertise, which seeks to improve the whistleblower protection structures in their society, both in law and via the use of technology, which is impacting all of us all the time, but no, um, but more, no more greater than it has been in the last year during the global pandemic. 
Sulet is particularly enthusiastic about encouraging and supporting women in IT, and we have an all-women panel, which is amazing. And on top of this, in whatever free time this woman has, she founded Blueprint for Free Speech in 2014 with a view to improving the standards of laws and practices around the globe to promote freedom of expression and focuses on whistleblowing as well. So again, what can I say? Sulet, please uh, and carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Anna. Um, Yes, I, I live a busy life, so to say the least. Um, look, I have uh, known Julian for a very long time, for in fact more than twenty years, and uh, uh, and I knew him when he started WikiLeaks um, in a, a small, rambling, and um, quirky uh, student house in Carlton, Victoria, which is right next to where the University of Melbourne is, where he studied. Um, and uh, and where I'm now a senior lecturer. Um, so it, it's an interesting thing. You know, he really spent quite a lot of time um, uh, thinking about structure of information, information sharing, accountability, and corruption. And one of the things that he spent the most time thinking about was not um, how could you solve this problem if you were, you know, George Soros, but actually if you were Julian Assange, if you were someone who had not very much money but pretty fantastic skills, um, time, motivation, and were very self-directed. Uh, and that's really where um, his development of WikiLeaks came from. Now he had a background um, in technology and in fact, in the not-for-profit area. So he'd spent thousands of hours volunteering um, in the free software movement, developing NetBSD and, and some contributions to FreeBSD. Those are operating systems of computers like your um, uh, Mac OS or your Windows operating system. Uh, these are Unix-based uh, ones. And so he, he donated a lot of time to that. But he also wrote free software programs some of which were eventually evolved and, and pieces of them were used even uh, in the uh, Apple operating system later on. For example, he wrote Strobe, which was a, a port scanner. So it would be used for free for people to actually test whether or not um, machines had ports open to the internet. So it's basically helping people cyber secure themselves. And he also uh, wrote, um, uh, was was part of the team and the lead of the team and it was his, his idea, um, the uh, rubber hose encrypted file system, which was the first deniable uh, encryption um, file system in the world. And that meant that human rights activists could actually, for the first time using this, um, encrypt data on a hard drive and encrypt data in a separate place on the hard drive and hide that data so that you would not be able to prove that there was um, you know, valuable hidden data on there if you decrypted under duress uh, the first lot of data. So it was very, very innovative. So that's a little bit um, about him. Um, I think, you know, it, the impact that he has had personally on journalism is is pretty much unsurpassed in the last decade, uh, you know, a decade and a half. And he's done that through um, his court cases. He's done that, not that he asked for those, but they have come his way and he has valiantly um, fought them. He uh, has refused to be cowed. Um, he has done that through the application innovations in technology. I mean, you know, WikiLeaks was really the first organization to innovate and introduce the secure digital Dropbox where sources could feel that safe in actually um, delivering, disclosing information to a publisher um, in his online publishing and uh, in the um, really the advancement of verified journalism. There had been some data journalism before but the idea that you would have an entire data set that had been disclosed to you as an investigative journalist so that people could verify what they were reading you know really before wikileaks most of the time we all just had to take it on faith that what the journalist was reporting to us was true um, but he, you know he found and not only um, verification capability that was given to the public by being able to look at that original data set, but also um, uh, he provided analysis to it in, in ways that most journalism outlets had not done before. So there'd been a little bit of that journalism, but you know, the idea that he would get uh, a disclosure of a set of um, orders by the US military and from analyzing into spreadsheets and database programs how many soldiers boots were being ordered for Iraq to be able to extract and understand how is that war going you know is it not going so well is it being ramped up without the public being telling you know being told um, that 
you know, that kind of data analysis driving the journalism was, was pretty innovative. Um, and so, and now we sort of think, oh, well, actually there are increasingly expectations of new journalists to have some ability to do data analysis. That certainly wasn't the case when, when he started out. And then the other innovation that he brought in was um, this collaborative global journalism. Uh, and so he really innovated that whereby um, journalist organizations in a set of countries, for example, for the uh, publication of the US diplomatic cables was uh, at least 89 different media partnerships. It was um, perhaps 75 different countries that were being covered. And they had never partnered before in this collegial manner to try and extract and analyze data to get the local stories out with sort of meta international stories being published um, by WikiLeaks and its major partners, um, such as the New York Times. Um, and now we've seen, of course, a slew of very important public interest journalism published in that style afterwards, the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, the Luxembourg uh, leaks, um, and the offshore leaks. Um, but that really was an innovation that, that he did. So I think all of those are testimony to his contribution. And, and I continue to find it astonishing that uh, any editor or journalist, and there are a number of them, um, should have uh, should have a hostile attitude towards um, him uh, and be anything less than supportive. I think the tide has turned on it. You know, this fantastic video that you just showed us really illustrates this sort of sea change of support as the next wave, this next generation of journalists who understand what he has contributed have forward and said, you should not be locking him up because when you lock him up, there's the potential to lock me up from my reporting. So I think those are kind of the key key observations I'd make um, about Julian, especially that intersection with technology that uh, that is so important. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Sulet. And we will be picking up um, with you. I've already got some questions, but I, I think what we'll do is go to the next panelist and then come back to have a discussion. Can I just check? I know Jennifer Robinson is joining us, um, uh, but I think that she would like a little bit more time. I was just checking if she was there. If not, I will move on and introduce you to uh, Stephanie Morizzi, um, who will pick up. So we have Jennifer Robinson, who will definitely be able to talk to us in much more detail about the legal challenges and the legal case and where, where Julian Assange is now um, and what's happening. But Stefania, you can pick up very much from what Sulet has laid the groundwork for, which is the which is the journalist side. Um, Stefania Morizzi is a, an investigative journalist uh, in Italy. Um, she is currently working for the major Major Italian daily Il Fatto Quotidiano. I don't know if I've said that correctly. Um, after working 14 years for the Italian daily La Repubblica and the Italian news magazine L'Espresso, she has worked on all the WikiLeaks releases of secret documents. She partnered with Glenn Greenwald to reveal the Snowden files about Italy. She's also interviewed AK, uh, AQ Khan, the father of the Pakistani atomic bomb. Um, and she's revealed the condolence payment agreement between the US government and the family of the Italian aid worker Giovanni Laporto killed in a US drone strike. So you have been in the middle of and um, uh, right in the center of a lot of the WikiLeaks disclosures, working as a journalist um, and understanding the impact um, and obviously doing great journalism a as a result. Um, you said that you started a multi-jurisdictional FOI, which is the Freedom of Information Access Litigation. And this um, is incredibly important litigation that Stefania has done almost single-handedly to defend the right of the press to access the full set of documents on the Julian Assange and WikiLeaks case. Uh, this is incredibly important because, and, and as uh, Jennifer will pick up with us shortly, um, we have a, an Australian citizen stuck in the UK being charged uh, under the US Espionage Act. We have journalists working across borders who need access to court documents in different countries. So power is moving, the need to follow that power is moving across borders, uh, and a lot of us get stuck within national jurisdictions and get treated as foreign agents or whatever we're treated as and don't are not seen as the public interest watchdogs that need access to all this information. So Stefania, would you like to make a statement please and let us know what you're thinking? Yes, and thank you, and thank you to the Disruption Lab and Tatiana for 
inviting me. So yes, absolutely. I mean, I was there from the very beginning. And uh, the reason why I was there from the very beginning when uh, <clears throat> Wikileaks had just been established is because uh, one of my sources, one of my journalistic sources, suddenly stopped talking to me because she was concerned about uh, um, legal consequences. So it was precisely at that point that I realized that I needed better source protection because the old fashioned uh, source protection techniques were completely, I mean, were completely uh, unsuitable for this uh, new age of um, surveillance, digital surveillance, digital communication. So it was at that point that basically one of my sources inside the cryptography world uh, told me, well, you should have a look on that bunch of lunatics. He, he was, the source was quite sympathetic, actually. It was an ironic uh, way to refer to Wikileaks. And uh, as soon as I look at their um, work, it was uh, basically in 2008. Uh, as soon as I look at their work, what mostly impressed me was uh, not just cryptography, was not just the, the, the use of data, was not, but it was their courage, you know, because they were publishing things that other people didn't want to publish. They were, I mean, they had just published, for example, the Guantanamo standard procedure for handling Guantanamo detainees, and the Pentagon had asked them to remove the documents, and they said no. And for me, it was, wow, is there a media organization which is basically <laughs> with just the guts to say no to the Pentagon? I mean, you have to remember, those he, in those years, we had newspapers refusing uh, to use the word torture for the torture. They were called the waterboarding and other uh, horrific torture, enhanced interrogation. So for me, it was amazing to realize that there was a media organization, which I knew very little about it at that time, and but what mostly impressed me was this fact that they were resisting these pressures and it was not you know it was not common at all because in these days everyone was basically siding with the u.s uh, military was siding with the u.s uh, on with the on the war on terror and you know and all these abuses took place also, thanks to the to the media, which was very you know very willing to cooperate with uh, with this kind of atmosphere, with these abuses, uh, you have to realize that, for example, the the Washington Post didn't publish the names of the countries where the CIA had black sites, you know. So I mean. It, it was in this, you have to realize that it was in this atmosphere, and this atmosphere is still here. And that's why there is so, so much silence around this case, and no one there to say anything, because there is a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of cooperation, I would say, I mean, by the media with this, with this kind of, um, with this, uh, these very abusive practices, you know? So it was, for me, it was amazing to realize that there was a media organization willing to be really aggressive, uh, really fearless, because you have to be fearless to say no to the Pentagon. You really have to be fearless, you know? And uh, also I was impressed by the fact that they want to democratize information. They want to put information available for large communities to empower large communities. They didn't want to act as gatekeepers. They want to publish the document so that any journalist, any community, any activist, any political uh, actors, any political, um, you know, uh, any politicians, any political activists, any NGO could access the documents directly. 
so that they couldn't realize they should not they were not supposed to you know to use privileged channels that was really important for me because it was completely new i mean i know what it means to have this information available after 10 years that the, the cables or the Afghan war logs were published. I still access these documents. And many uh, activists, NGOs, and uh, you know, scholars all around the world do the same. The first thing, when Khashoggi was killed, when he was <clears throat> killed by the Saudi, uh, by the Saudi um, regime, the first thing that basically the Washington Post did was to access the hacking team emails to look for cyber weapons provided by the Italian company, famous Italian company hacking team to the Saudi regime. The first thing they did was this. So that information keep empowering people, even if it was published 10 years ago, five years ago, is still available and is still empowering people. That's why I think it's, a, it's a, you know, it's unique. If you take the Panama Papers, for example, that's a very important scoop. I mean, I, I don't want to deny that the Panama Papers are very important scoop, is a very important scoop. Of course it is. They, they won a Pulitzer Prize, but at the same time, they don't publish documents. So they, those documents are not made available to a large community. So you don't have access, so you don't have scholars accessing them. You don't have large communities. You don't have activists. You, know, you don't have people using them to go to, to the European Court of Human Rights. So you don't have the Chagos Highlanders using the documents to, for their fights. So that's why I think the WikiLeaks model and courage because you need courage to publish these documents. Uh, many times the Pentagon, the White House, and the, <clears throat> the State Department put pressure and intimidated them. And that's why Julian is in prison. That's why he has never known freedom again. He has never known, after publishing these documents, he has never known freedom again. You know? Thank you, Stefania. That's, sorry. Yeah, let is that, me just finish. This. Yes, yes. That's why he's yeah. in prison. He's not in prison for other reason. After publishing these documents, he has never known freedom again. This is what the the case is about. It's not about the Russia Gate. He's not in prison for Russia Gate. He's not in prison for Russia. He's not in prison for for Sweden. He's not in prison for rape. He's in prison for revealing war crimes and torture. Thank you Thank so you. much, Stefania. We'll definitely come back to pick up on these points. Uh, Jennifer, Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know that was a little touch and go just at the beginning there. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to be sharing the platform with you along with our other panelists. Um, I would like to introduce you and then I'd be really grateful to pass the uh, to the the um, the audience to you. Um, Jennifer Robinson is an Australian human rights lawyer and barrister with Doughty Street Chambers in London. At the moment, I understand she is in Australia. Beco before coming to the bar, she founded the Birth of Justice Initiative and is Director of Legal Advocacy for the Bertha Foundation in London. She is also a lecturer in law at the University of Sydney Law School. And of course, she is incredibly well known for her work um, as a longstanding member of the legal team defending Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. But you started advising them I understand as early as 2010, perhaps a bit uh, earlier than that. Um, and obviously she's also provided legal assistance to activists from West Papua. So she, you are a human rights lawyer. You are an incredible defender of, of freedom of expression. You've been at the center of what I would say is the largest case in the world with these issues all coming together uh, around one organization and in the end, one man, which seems incredible. Uh, and I would really, really appreciate uh, listening to you and to hearing what you to where he is now, how he ended up being charged under the U.S. Espionage Act, and what we can do to help next. Can you unmute? I think we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me okay now? Perfect. Great. First, thank you so much for hosting me, and I really
really how terrible internet in Australia, the NBN system holds up for us, uh, both myself and the uh, address from Australia. But I would like to pay tribute to some of the West Call um, who have each contributed so much to um, for free speech and in particular for just case. It's invaluable to hear from Sula about, love hearing from Sula about Julian's background um, and what, what he did before weeks that so few people understand around and he's contributed to the human rights community, which is something that I feel very strongly about as his counsel, but also as a lawyer working in the human rights space. Stefania, who speaks so eloquently and who I also have the privilege of presenting on her FOI fight in the K to access the documents that show um, the way the government has treated this case, which is we suspect didn't have access to information and thank God we know. And of course, Bliss is co editor did such a book and resource about WikiLeaks um, and contributed so much through her own work. So first I want to pay tribute to the wonderful women on the call and to you as an all-women panel, which is unusual. So um, I have, have had the honor of representing pleasure and privilege and uh, challenge representing Julian over the past 10 years. So I first got involved in, in 2010. Um, but as well, even before... Yes, I don't know to come back um, through my phone if that's better. I don't know if you want to try and go to somebody else first. It's, there's really terrible internet in Australia. Okay. That's fine, Jennifer. We'll come, we'll, with Felicity, and we'll come back to you when you join. Thank you. Okay, great. They're so interconnected, these, the, the different perspectives on, on Julian's case, that it's an it's actually a, a very easy and smooth link to Felicity um, Ruby, and we'll come back to Jennifer. Um, Felicity Ruby is a PhD candidate at Sydney University and co-editor of a book that I understand has become incredibly popular very quickly and is uh, selling very very much. Um, it's a secret Australia revealed by the WikiLeaks exposés. Uh, it was released at the beginning of December, um, and I know that Jennifer, there it is, so I am getting a copy, sorry, I haven't got one yet, that Jennifer and Ruby, uh, sorry, and Sulet have both contributed to. But Felicity has a long uh, and incredible history and experience. Uh, she was senior advisor to the Australian Green Senator, Scott Ludlam, uh, who held the communications portfolio and successfully fought data retention and internet censorship proposals, as well as supporting Australian citizen, Julian Assange. Um, she, prior to this, incredibly, she had another career as a, a heading the UN office for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, was policy advisor at the UN Development Fund for Women and at Greenpeace International. Um, I understand the latest title, so you may be changing the title of your PhD dissertation, um, is The Fourth Eye, Australia's Role in the Five Eyes Before and After Snowden. It may be changing. I know these things are, are incredible labors of love. But Felicity, it's an, a really a huge honor to have you on the panel. Um, I would be really interested in you know hearing from you about how you see secrecy and what WikiLeaks was doing what Julian was doing uh, to really shine a light on what we see now as an incredible overreach of surveillance and corporate power um, and obviously it resonates and it's continuing to resonate we're all in a big fight it seems at the moment so please um, over to you right <clears throat> thank you it's um Wonderful to be here. I feel vicariously, somehow strangely, in Berlin, a place that I miss very much, and it's lovely to be with all these wonderful women. Um, so I um, thought I'd pick up on the issue of repression, which is one of the themes for the conference and for this panel. Um, it's uh, something that I think about quite a lot. Um, I thought I'd start with something that actually Julian said about surveillance. Um, I think it can also be related to discussions about repression. He said, surveillance is not something that happens outside of us, like nuclear weapons or like global warming. We can't sit back and talk about and discuss and theorise about how to deal with it. It's something that's happening inside us and between us to all people simultaneously. This is something that affects how we speak to each other and how we consider the world and even how we consider this very problem. This is a problem that feeds on itself. 
a certain paranoia develops in response to knowing the truth about this issue. That paranoia can be paralyzing. So even talking about this issue can make the problem worse if we're not very careful because people become concerned that if they talk about the National Security Agency or the United States in certain ways. So it could be a runaway process in that people who are surveilled don't like to speak to each other about these problems and the result is that they don't speak to each other about these problems as much and the problem gets worse faster. So I relate this to the situation with Julian because talking too much about the repression of Julian and WikiLeaks and, and what they are suffering can freak people out and deter them from participating in the solution. It's impossible to motivate people without, um, about, to act against injustice without knowing about it. But the nature of the repression of this man um, of, of his name and of his reputation and of his family, um, the effort to destroy his life is shocking and it's sinister and it's disturbing and it's so, so wrong. And I would go so far as to say that he's being subjected to a very intimate terrorism. WikiLeaks and Julian are being repressed because the truths that they revealed were not just inconvenient, they were unfiltered and intolerable to power. And that power wants to make the truths disappear and it wants to make the model of journalism and publishing disappear and they want to make Julian disappear. And those waging this repression, of course, want to provoke fear and retreat. But they've also provoked defiance and anger. And repression has a habit of doing that. Julian has and is suffering greatly, um, but he's not, as the current Foreign Minister of Ecuador tweeted a few days ago, dead. He's alive and he is in a COVID infested cage that I have visited twice and it's a haunting experience, but he survives. And the movements and the sectors participating in calls for him to walk free have also survived. Uh, many concerted efforts, infiltrated, mysterious technical problems, full frontal assaults by institutions, such smearing of this man's character um, as a way of making these truths disappear. But still these movements and the calls for his freedom are growing. And our aim is that he doesn't just survive, but that he thrives once again. Here in Australia, um, Julian enjoys quite broad support indeed. Um, and from quite senior political levels, former prime ministers and former foreign ministers are quite vocal now. Um, and there's a parliamentary group, a Bring Assange Home parliamentary group that has members from all political parties participating, and that's also growing. Uh, human rights and digital rights and civil liberties and legal and religious and social justice organisations are, are adamant. And Julian's union, the MEAA, um, the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, is working both behind the scenes and also uh, publicly to bring pressure to bear both on our gut also on their membership of journalists and, and that's working. And activists in all capitals are, are organising outside US consulates and town halls and um, various street actions. And Julian's father is right now going around the country from small country town to small country town to larger regional centre to capital city. Um, and he's finding overwhelming support uh, as he goes from, from ordinary Australians. So sometimes repression inspires anger and defiance instead of fear and retreat. And uh, after many years, we're seeing the tides turn here. Uh, incarcerated refugees understand this and First Nations people understand too what repression is and what it can bring us to a moment of, of anger and defiance when we're not alone and where this is shared. So I think that's where we are. And in closing, I just want to recommend two books. Um, the first is um, this book called A Secret Australia, which I co-edited, which was rebuffed on before. And I commend it to Australians because it tells the story of what WikiLeaks has taught us about Australia. But I also uh, commend it to non-Australians um, because this model could work well in other countries where are gathering activists and lawyers and journalists and academics to explore what we've learned about Germany, what we've learned about France, what we've learned about Iraq, what we've learned about Afghanistan, thanks to WikiLeaks could also produce rich volumes. And second, I want to say that one of the most interesting books I've read um, is called The Art of Revolt by Geoffroy Lagassanari. 
who's a French academic. Um, and it's just, it, I've just been rereading it again, um, partly to participate in this panel. And it explores Manning, Assange and Snowden and how they've invented a new political, and I would add journalistic and publishing practice. Um, that they've broken with tradition in whole new ways and we're still grappling to find a language uh, to describe what they've done. Um, in that they've extended the spaces of democracy and the ways that we can conceive of democracy and understanding our um, political institutions and their accountability, but also how we understand ourselves as political subjects. They have, according to this academic, created new ways of understanding how it is to resist and what it is to be citizens of democracy or of the internet and to be protected by democracy and the internet as opposed to being protected by states. So um, they're the, the things that they've given us um, and we, we need to really give them um, the protection and the support that they deserve. And I feel that that, that tide is turning. So I might leave it there. Ah, thank you very much, Felicity. Um, and the tide needs to turn also towards uh, Jennifer and understanding the legal case. But um, we have Jennifer here, um, but she's not going to be on video. So Jennifer, can you hear me? I can. Hear me okay. Yes, beautiful. So go ahead, please. Great. Well, first, my apologies for Australia's terrible um, <laughs> a conservative government did a terrible job on our internet and this. I'm, I'm not sure how much everybody heard. I did want to pay tribute to the women on this panel who have each contributed so much to um, to freedom, him back his freedom rather. Um, and so I'm really grateful to them for their perspectives. But since we're probably short on time, let me just launch. I've been representing Julian and had the pleasure and the challenge representing him since 2000. And of course, as far back as learning about the US indictment in publishing activities with WikiLeaks, um, I think it's always important when we think about, when we talk about him and the situation. I want to remind everyone that he is a dad and a human being who has been under some form of restriction on his liberty for the past decade, almost the entire time that I've known him. Um, as Stefani has not had his publish those publications, and it's important to remember what those publications are about, both the fact that he is a human who is two years in a high security prison uh, as described a COVID-ridden case. Um, on a US extradition request that is uni unanimously and universally condemned by free speech groups, major mainstream media organizations and human rights organizations around the world. He has been two years in that high security prison for the very same publications for which he's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize and for which he won Australia's Pulitzer, the Walkley Award for most outstanding contribution to journalism. The stark the injustice of the situation is so stark, it's hard to describe, and I found a broken record, but it's worth repeating because it is just that horrendous. Um, as a human rights WikiLeaks, we long represented, began representing him, and I was struck by how important this information was and what they were do doing was for the human rights and for human rights accountability around the world. The publications that he he is in prison for food publications providing evidence of war crimes, human rights, and corruption the world over. With the first diplomatic cables, the Iraq logs, the Afghan material, evidence of matters that have been put before courts around the world. And this is a person who is in prison providing us that public service. Um, the current situation for Julian is we had our extradition last year. Um, we were successful in that challenge. The decision was handed down in January. And the judge, while the judgment is terrible, it was the wrong, it was a terrible decision, provided the right outcome, which prevent effectively she found that he should not be extradited. Not on free speech grounds, not 
not because of the public interest of his publications, but she and we agree with her finding that his extradition would be oppressive on the grounds of his particular mental health situation his depression, I will commit suicide if he is extradited. That is a particular finding related to his personal um, psychological circumstances, but also the oppressive prison conditions that he would face. It's interesting to know the US will put him under special administrative measures if he is extradited, which has been described by human rights groups as the darkest black hole of the US prison system. I'd be able to speak to him. I called it. He would have very limited access to us as Yeah. Yeah, that's too bad because Jennifer, we're having trouble hearing you and it the, the delays are getting longer. Um, unfortunately. So perhaps I can ask um, the panelists to join again and uh, and I would really like to start opening up a discussion. Jennifer, if you can hear us and you might want to try occasionally, we'll see if we can get you back. Um, but uh, I feel like I'm one of those radio talk show people where the person just, our guest disappears. Um, but what Jennifer was saying is so important that, that we've had a judgment that came up with the right answer uh, in the sense that Julian should not be extradited but the judgment did not deal with the issues that we're all facing we're all talking about it did not deal with the public interest it did not um, give him freedom on the basis of freedom of expression for instance and so really it was on his own personal situation which is absolutely diabolical what he's been going through but it doesn't really set a standard for others being um, tried in this way so uh, Sulet, did you want to pick up a little bit on that and maybe expand on a little bit of what uh, Jennifer was trying to put to us and then we can open up the discussion? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the key thing here is that um, Julian Assange is facing a set of charges um, which uh, are enormous, I mean, more than 100 years in prison if he's convicted in the US, but they have such phenomenal impact on journalism. This is a dangerous case to have heard in the US. Aside from the human factors, aside from everything else, it will set a precedent. And that precedent says if you, the investigative journalist, ask your source for data to back up a claim of corruption, of serious wrongdoing, of whatever, then you are potentially at risk. And, and this is actually interesting because it's the new fire front in the bushfire um, of, of whistleblowing you know, issues. And that is around um, data crimes. You know, Has a whistleblower stolen data? Well, no, they've actually just taken information that is necessary to prove the serious wrongdoing, to prove the corruption. And they provided it in the public interest. They might have done that through to an anti-corruption agency via a secure Dropbox. They might have done that to a journalist, but that is really vital. Increasingly, however, we see that particularly with cases like Julian, it's like, oh, well, you're a hacker, hacker, hacker. No, you're a whistleblower. No, you're a publisher. And what you're doing is in the public interest. It's being reframed by institutions who want to, um, for example, push their own career. A personal prosecutor wants to push his own career. A previous administration in the US had a whole bunch of political agendas. One thing that I find really amazing is that uh, so many um, people in the left were um, so critical of Julian Assange, but really Julian Assange uh, is, you know, he stands for the same values that they stand for. You know, he, he stands for an open society. He stands for transparency and accountability. Um, he believes in a free media to be able to, to do those things and to publish freely. And you know, people have accused him of being anti-American, but he had always spoken to me. He had a, he had a poster of a quote by Thomas Jefferson on his living room wall, you know, and, and so that, that's not right at all. He's, you know, been an enormous um, admirer of the U.S. system of, of freedoms. And, and in some ways, I think he's 
quite a unique nexus point because in a society that is so fragmented and at war with itself, he provides a path forward for left and right between the libertarian right about freedoms and the left who wants a society that is about accountability of the powerful to the to the less powerful. He has been less powerful. You know, he has not been a wealthy person who who could, you know, who could who could empower activists by giving them a lot of funding. He's been the person who's tried to change things with very little. And I find what's quite interesting about his case is that he's managed to actually empower so many. Um, so inspiration to NGOs, the Foundation of Courage Foundation, the Freedom of the Press, Press Foundation, um, certainly it was an inspiration to me uh, in founding Blueprint for Free Speech. Um, our wonderful uh, UK Ireland program director is running a project, uh, Bridges for Media Freedom, that is you know, following his case and reporting on it meticulously. And that's in a sense a model for how you observe, watch, and accurately report on these watershed cases, um, you know, for, for the future. So he kind of inspires these activists to go off and do new and creative things. And yet here he is still sitting in this prison facing charges that are, I mean, espionage. He's not a U.S. citizen. He's not a spy. It's, it's madness. And they are, I think, correctly, as you said, uh, Flick, there are charges about trying to um, disempower someone who is in the way. They are charges about, uh, you know, they don't, and, and Stefania was absolutely right. He is there, not for any particular thing than the fact that he has offended the powerful. Can I just jump in there and ask something to Felicity and then come back to Stefania, because this is a great segue, but, um, one of the things that I was really interested in that you were saying, Felicity, and, and it, you know, maybe these are too trite or, or shortened ways of thinking about it, but technology has, in the way it's democratized information, you know, people have made the connection to where we, when we had the printing press, you know, and it's almost like we have this ability to use the printing press as a direct tool, and we're dealing with that as a, through all the stuff online anyway, as a population, as a people, how we ha handle direct information and direct communication. But we had, what, you know, was Julian uh, sort of ahead of the curve? Would he, someone like him have come along and done some of what he did? And secondly, do we need, does he need to be a martyr to this cause? Is that what is happening, that he is being chosen as the one to sort of take the fall for this opening up where we're all still trying to work out where we fit and what the, what the framework is that allows the public interest to carry on? You know, is that what's happening here? Is he sort of in between a messiah and a martyr? Let me talk about technology first. I get to Messiah business. It's just a um, small question, yeah. I think that, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, Julian was around uh, at the start of the internet and um, that was a time when this is before the internet was broken by the corporate monsters that have turned what was potentially a library of Alexandria into a McDonald's. Um, before the internet was broken, the potential for it to truly um, provide open learning, to truly um, even out power structures so that professors could speak to 12 year olds um, and, and, and each teach each other. The idea um, of the flat structures and the potential of the internet to truly democratize information and sharing and knowledge and learning. Um, he was around for that. And so I think that WikiLeaks is a is a is definitely a result of being around at an optimistic time of the internet and mm -hmm. is a natural um, result uh, of, of that innovation and, and, and of that, um, that potential. Uh, even despite the broken internet, we have encryption, which is basically tunneling a secure channel uh, through that um, broken internet. And so he was able to, yeah, um, innovate, but also realize potential in, in a way. Um, but that was also due to having some political sixth sense and, and training um, and experience and growing up as somebody in, in our book uh, set thinks, um, growing up in Melbourne, uh, like the coming of age in Melbourne at least, um, a very political town um, that was affected very much by um, some of the 
the ways that Australia is a is a, you know beset by a colonial mindset, and in the seventies um, was starting to burst out of that in in anti war movements and in in um, you know realizing the power of the Americans when they removed our government in nineteen seventy five. So it's politics, but it's also technology, and I think that it's the combination um, of of journalism, publishing, and technology that he's realised in whole new ways. Julian doesn't um, wish to be a martyr; um, he wishes to be a publisher, and he wants to get on with um, realising um, uh, the progress of human civilization. He he would like to um, for us to reform institutions and to truly understand them. He's somebody who's so committed to learning and knowledge and information um, that I don't think anything as simplistic as as being messiahs or martyrs is interesting. He's much more complex and complicated and uh, and uh, and interesting than that. Is he becoming one by default? Um, yes, that's that's again another end goal, uh, own goal. When Julian was 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 in the embassy, all he could do was work. It was a really silly idea for them to not let things progress because he was doing fantastic work. And similarly, in his in the repression, in 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 his in his the overreach, in the extreme vindictive. Um, prosecution that we're seeing, it is indeed that that is arousing um, the indignation and the response. Another own goal, um, that making such an example of this person is causing, even after such um, psychological operations to, to condition people to hate him so, um, it even overcomes that, how outrageous what's happening to him truly is. So um, an unwilling martyr, and uh, um, and and certainly not a messiah. He's too naughty to be a messiah. Um, but he's he's um, yeah, an, an unwilling martyr. I, I I don't want him to be a martyr, and he doesn't either. Can can I then ask you, Stefania? Because I think this is really sort of moving away from that sort of false dichotomy, I think, and false uh, setup. Um, we, are, we are in this phase, and, and I work with the, you know, whistleblowers who may or may not be journalist sources and may or may not have access to great amounts of data. But for all of us in the field of NGOs, journalists, and information, this fight over information, we are sharing a really similar ground where the, where the methodology of repression is acted out on each of us um, and uh, the actors that are trying to release information are feeling the same methodologies coming at them. So, you know, in terms of journalism and the impact of this case on the ability, you know, both his, both WikiLeaks and Julian's actions to change journalism, which we've touched on and you've touched on, but also this issue of his, the fact that he is being persecuted in this way, what is the impact on journalists and journalism that you're seeing? And what do you see as some of the things that, that journalists and the, the, the circles in which they operate need to do to come together and bring Julian back into their fold, you know, really seeing him as part of their strategy? Well, first of all, they have to they have to realize <clears throat> they have to start doing their job. You know, I mean, I'm very harsh in what <laughs> I will <clears throat> say, but you have to realize that in the last in the seven years he was inside the embassy, no one tried to get the the, the documents about his case, and everyone was reporting what. The, what the Swedish authorities were saying and what the Julian Assange lawyers were saying is not what you are supposed to do. You are supposed to open the window and look for truth. And no one did it. And it took an Italian journalist. I'm not, I'm not trying to promote myself. I'm just trying to make you realize how depressing the journalism in these days you know it's uh, absolutely depressing that they uh, we have this kind of journalism completely dead journalism i mean you cannot accept that a, a publisher remains in, in in an embassy without an hour or door and no one tried to get the documents and try to discover what went wrong about this case you you cannot accept 
this kind of <laughs> journalism. This is not journalism. So the first thing is uh, to try to realize how bad in how bad it is in these days. The the, the uh, journalism is uh, you know it's uh, it's crucial to have a different kind of journalism. It's crucial to have an aggressive journalism. It's crucial to realize that you know these people are risking their uh, lives and freedoms for doing what we should do. I mean, even if, take for example the Snowden case. I mean, without them, Snowden would be in a, a maximum security prison in the U.S. You know, no one help. No one provided a shred of practical help to Edward Snowden. I mean, he is one of the biggest journalistic sources of all time. And you had prominent newspapers getting these scoops from, from Edward Snowden and winning Pulitzer Prizes thanks to these these amazing journalistic sources and no one did anything and now they, and these people these wikileaks people risk their freedom for because they had to save one of the most important journalistic sources of all, all times and i wonder why the garden did not why the washington post did not i mean they had a huge contractual power because they had the Snowden documents, they had connections, they had prominent lawyers, and they did absolutely nothing. So this gives, I mean, if you take people, it's not just about Julian Assange, it's about all Wikileaks journalists, journalists, especially Sarah Harrison, who went to Hong Kong to to help Edward Snowden. So, I mean, why it takes Wikileaks to do these things? Because the traditional media, the powerful media have stopped doing these things. I mean, they, they don't do it. These are the medias which were calling, announcing ter uh, the tortures, announcing interrogations, you know? So the, it's, a, it's about, uh, unless we, unless we, uh, you know, unless we analyze the causes, unless we analyze the reasons why we are in such bad shape, uh, unless we we realize in that journalism is is in a very bad shape in these days, so we won't win this case. We won't, and we we absolutely have to win this case. I mean, I I really want to make people realize how it is important, not just for for us, for for journalism, is for all all of us. I mean, these people basically introduce something revolutionary, which is uh, which goes far beyond the you know the platform, the whistleblowing submission, or whatever. They introduce the concept that these powerful people, the CIA, the NSA, the Pentagon can be accountable because we can access their information and discover their crimes and expose war crimes, torture, and so on. So they introduced this. And before them, it was Daniel Ellsberg. And then it was Chelsea Manning. And then it was Edward Snowden. So they introduced this. And this power, which doesn't want the sunlight, which doesn't want to be accountable, is furious about them. It's absolutely furious. These people want, yeah. want to destroy them. So this struggle is not just the struggle of journalists or people. It's the struggle of all of us who want accountability for these people. We don't want to have these people above the law, but they are above the law because we don't even have access to the information about what they do with with WikiLeaks, with Snowden, with Chelsea, with Daniel Esberg, with these people, we have had access to this kind of factual information about what they do. So this is a, a unique opportunity and we must win because we don't want that they win. We absolutely don't want that the war criminals win. We don't want that the torturers win. 
we want that the people who expose them and expose their crimes win. So we want that the Chelsea Manning win, the Daniel Ellsberg win, the Snowden win, Julian Assange win, Sarah Harrison, WikiLeaks journalists win. That's why we want that they win. It's about winning, being on the right side, you know, on the right side. So the, sorry, I want to tell you one last thing. We never WikiLeaks reveal uh, large data sets of uh, secret information. I had the families of Italian victims of um, violence during the 70s. We had, uh, you know, a lot of um, terrorist attacks by the far right. Uh, basically, we had the so called strategy of tension when the far right were siding with the secret services and uh, the, the fascist groups, and they were trying to destabilize Italy. So um, seven, uh, 50 years after, these families don't know who was responsible for what. So there's no accountability. And each time WikiLeaks was publishing these data sets, I had these families contacting me, could you please check in the databases whether there is something about this episode or another episode? Or, because they, they know that there is no way to know. I mean, due to the state secrecy, there is no way to make these people accountable. So this is what WikiLeaks is about. It's about making them accountable and providing this information to everyone, not just to the journalists, not just to the professionals and not just to the gatekeepers, but to everyone, to the NGOs, to the scholars, to, to democratize this access to this secret information, to empower community, to make these people accountable. That's why we want to win. I, I mean, I want to win. And if you are, I mean, if you are on the right side, you understand that you, we have to win. We cannot allow the Pentagon or the or the CIA or the NSA to win this case, and they absolutely want to do it. Sula, you wanted to jump in there, I think. Thank you, Stefania. Yeah, I think um, um, uh, Jen had a lovely tribute to the to the uh, women on this panel, but I particularly like to point out about Stefania and in a sense how what WikiLeaks and Julie, Julian has done is to create change and then amplify more change. So as a result of the case against Julian, Stefania has run and is, is pretty modest about it, um, an incredible case uh, in the UK that has resulted in prying open with a legal crowbar access to documents that should have been available uh, to journalists and the public uh, through FOI that were being hidden. And in fact, she subsequently found not just hidden, but in fact, a set of documents by the Crown Prosecutor's Office around the issue of whether Julian would be extradited to Sweden uh, on these um, charges that were never laid. And they had been destroyed. These documents had been destroyed. It was yes. extraordinary as a breach of policy, as a breach of protocol, on top of which there were documents in there that Stefania won access for the public to that showed that the Crown Prosecutor's Office was instructing the Swedish investigators to not come and interview Julian Assange about their investigation, which is bad for justice, disrespectful of Julian Assange, and disrespectful of the women as well. So in other words, being told by one country to another to not do their job, all of this was hidden. And it was only through Stefania's really phenomenal tenacity and at personal cost, both financial and you know time and everything else, that this information has come to light. But in a sense, it's part of the ongoing cascade of revelations that we've seen that has come from Julian Assange and the cases. Is that fair, Stefania? Have I described that well? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, you, you cannot understand this case unless you you realize that this Crown Prosecution Service, which was in in charge of co cooperating with the Swedish with the Swedish authorities, is the very same uh, agency which is uh, in charge of the U.S. extradition. 
So it's not the Crown Prosecution Service, not just about the Swedish case. It is also about the U.S. extradition case. So if they behave this way with the Swedish case, I mean, we can guess how they behave with the, with the U.S. extradition. They destroyed the documents. We are still fighting in the British tribunals to get information why they destroyed the documents about the crucial case, which was which is ongoing and which is highly prof uh, high profile and very controversial. They should have never ever destroyed the documents. And we discovered this destruction of documents because they were li lying to us, basically. They were saying, we released you all the documents we had and we discovered, I discovered it was, it was not true. It was not true because uh, basically, there were no conversation about crucial times. For example, the week Julian took refuge in the embassy. It was impossible that the Swedish authorities and the UK authorities had not exchanged any communication in those weeks. So I discovered they did not provide the full documentation. And when we asked with my lawyers, Jennifer and Estelle, we asked, could you please provide everything? Because you didn't. They said, we destroy. And when we ask, what did you destroy? They don't even know what they destroyed. I mean, now can you accept? <laughs> you know, this is the agency which is now in charge of the US extradition, you know? How can you believe that this, they, they will handle you know, it's uh, I'm very concerned about the, how they will handle this UX extradition due to the standards, due, due to these things. They they help help create the legal paralysis and the diplomatic quagmire, which basically has kept Julian Assange in London since 2010. They told the Swedish prosecutor, "Don't come here." They said. The Swedish prosecutors wanted to close the invest the drop the investigation just one year after he had took refuge in the embassy. They said they didn't want to do it. They said that don't you dare get confused, you know? And they said this is not an extradition like any other. And you know, there are so many mysteries about the operations of this agency that I'm really concerned about how they are handling the U.S. extradition due to this background, you know? There's so much here. I'm trying to um, sort of draw some of it back a little bit because I do think one of the things, not back from anything, but just maybe draw it to somewhere at the moment, we are also living through a global pandemic. And we have seen the need for access to information. We've seen the fact that doctors and nurses and people on front line, which includes anyone selling food and anyone running buses, um, uh, they are providing us with frontline services. And they were telling things. They weren't trying to raise it internally or go to a regulator. They were speaking immediately to journalists to let us know. We know that Dr. Lee in Wuhan uh, was trying to share information about this, about the, about this uh, virus uh, and was warned off by the police. And before he died, he decided he needed to make sure everyone had that information. So we have a, a, a sort of moment or have had a moment where there's been clarity about the need for information. You know, it keeps us safe on a very basic fundamental level, which is always why talking about whistleblowing in hospitals is very effective uh, um, when you talk to bankers. Do you need whistleblowing to happen in hospitals if you, your daughter's about to go under surgery and there's a negligent doctor? We don't seem to have that same immediate sense of the importance of national security being equally responsive to its population. But we're also dealing with understanding that COVID has shown populations that are vulnerable We've got Julian Assange in a prison. Um, it's already a repressive situation, and prisons are a hotbed of, of disease. Um, and so I wondered if, if one of you would like to pick up a little bit on some of these thoughts around 
we as a population of the world should understand the nature of information, how how vaccines are shared, research is done, how governments interfere, how corporate money flows. These are all things that Julian Assange was helping us understand at a national security level. We need to understand at a very basic human level that connects us, does it not, to him? And right now he's a person in trouble in a, in a prison. Do you want to pick up on that, Felicity? Any of that? <laughs> Throwing another big lot at you? Yeah, I think um, I agree with everything you say there. Um, something that Julian talks about um, a lot is we need to understand our current situation. We need to understand the institutions and the culture inside those institutions in order to be able to, um, to either bring about change or to um, to evolve. So the the linkage between um, information and accountability, um, the possibility of um, transparency um, uh, as a looming um, eventuality um, when it's about um, for perhaps cabinet documents becoming available thirty years later, um, bringing that a little bit closer to the now. Um, is is the kind of the power of the model in a way that the, the the turning of the gaze of surveillance back uh, by people onto the state is is kind of the the power of the of the model in in many respects, but also um, the urgency of us having information in real time um, has never been clearer when it comes to something as consequential as COVID. To link the issue of COVID, um, I just want to reflect a little bit about um, the legal case, which I was hoping Jennifer could speak about a little bit. But um, the the ways that the COVID context was uh, was instrumentalised to shut down visibility of this most momentous case um, was was very very um, pronounced for me. Uh, the the judge. Um, you know, stopped the um, the public being able to observe even via video conference on the very morning of the of the of the first day of the of the evidentiary hearing. Forty NGOs that had access were just cut out of nowhere. Um, it was very very difficult for journalists to be able to get access to that feed, and so um, demonstrators weren't allowed to demonstrate out the front. Um, Participants weren't able to to appear. Um, NGOs and and open democracy, open justice um, proponents were not able to to fulfil that function. Um, and Julian um, was subjected to uh, you know quite um, health compromising um, procedures every day in the um, transportation and also the kind of mindless and crazy sort of strip searching necessities. So so the COVID um, context was very, very difficult for the case in all kinds of ways, let alone uh, Julian having access to his lawyers. In, in this case where he faces life and death in a prison, he hasn't been able to have access to his lawyers to, to, to instruct them um, and to prepare this case. So it's been like incredibly compounding of an already extremely um, difficult situation. Um, he hasn't had access to any visitors either. So being 23 and a half hours alone each day in a cell um, where even receiving a piece of paper um, is dangerous let alone sitting in a video conference room that others have used in order to be able to have a conversation. I mean, this is just, it's just taken what was already intolerable into a whole other realm, but also, as I said before, instrumentalised, um, you know, to, um, to, to close our ability to analyse and access and view so that the whole court case we had to, we had to experience through tweet threads. So I sat up from, um, you know, 10 at night until 3 in the morning to be able to watch some Twitter threads from some journal had access to a video feed. This was insane. We could have just streamed it. Anyway, um, that's my kind of contribution about the connection with COVID. 
Great. I mean, I think there's two things that just strike me, and then I'd, I'd like to pand it back to Stefania and, and Sulet. But if anyone understands at all what it's like to be isolated, then the world has a, a glimpse. You know, it's already hard enough to stay in your own apartment uh, and work online and take one walk a day. But you, that gives us a, just a very tiny sense of what it's like to have your liberty uh, curtailed. And then if you're in this kind of situation, it's beyond anything that we can imagine, but at least we're on that track. So that's one thing that can bring us closer to this issue. The second one, which I sort of bring back to the national security issue and then pandemic information, when when we've had these uh, the 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 narrative, which there's obviously some real truth to issues around terrorism, but then we have a narrative of terrorism and the ability to use that in the overreach to shut down public spaces, to shut down protests, perhaps use those laws against other groups that governments are finding difficult to deal with, um, on under the guise of of uh, protecting the public from terrorism. We now have, and we should all be very very aware. Um, a pandemic. There are really fundamental good reasons for not circulating, for taking for taking uh, um, protective measures. But we, as a public, need to stay on top of this to ensure that it isn't used for other reasons to continue what is already we're aware of the uh, the instinctive um, use of power to then use it for other things that are uncomfortable rather than just public safety. So again, two things that bring us right back to WikiLeaks and. Julian Assange and the model of publishing and access to information. Sulet, would you like to jump in and yeah. then Stefania? Um, so it is fairly extraordinary that um, the US facing one of the worst battles of any country in terms of COVID would want to put in jail for up to 175 years. The journalist who is the biggest proponent of evidence-based reporting fact-based reporting so the publishing of original documents to encourage not misinformation and disinformation but accurate information really i think in some ways the greatest threat that the u.s faces is there are so many people who don't accept accurate information act on accurate information um, and and those in the media who uh, promulgate fake information um, knowingly or otherwise, you know, they are a danger to society. But if you if you lock up the people who espouse the principle of, you know, revealing real information and proving it with documentation, what kind of message does that send as as a society? Um, and, you know, and that that's really, for me, the strangest dichotomy of this. Um, and, and in the second element of that, we've seen the growth of the digital secure and anonymized drop boxes that were first really introduced by WikiLeaks. And they've been incredibly important uh, in the COVID fight as healthcare workers have had to disclose wrongdoing about um, supply chain corruption, um, you know, goods that promise to do things, COVID tests that aren't, aren't valid, don't work. Um, you know, where are vaccines going when they're reported to be going to a different place? Do they actually work? What are, you know, what is Big Pharma actually telling us? We would like accurate information and how are countries interacting with each other? You know, and so the digital aspect of being able to disclose that information via secure Dropbox is incredibly important because a lot of healthcare workers, um, uh, you know, they don't have experience with whistleblowing. They're, this is a new thing. Um, and many of them have been kind of co-opted into coping with um, COVID who've become frontline, frontline health workers, never, never having dealt with any of this before. So this is a very important outlet that um, in a sense, he's been the father of developing uh, and, and yet still the US wants to, you know, to keep these charges against him. There was an opportunity here when the Biden administration came in to drop these charges. And when the ruling came down from the lower court in the UK to go, right, this is going to be a big effort um, uh, to, to fight this battle. We should, it's not worth the time and money. We should just drop these charges. Now, the US DOJ has continued with them, but I hope that there is some um, thoughtful process going on in the senior elements of the new administration to say, in a world surrounded by bushfires on all sides, 
um, you know, does it really make sense to be fighting um, the journalists? No, it does not. So that that would be my sort of comment about what he contributes and the importance of COVID on that. Thank you, Sulet. Stefania, have you got some comments or thoughts around COVID and the impact? Yes, I mean, <clears throat> let's not forget the, the, the fact that this national security has, uh, you know, had, has had a role in this crisis. I mean, we have been focusing uh, forever wars for the last 20 years, and we haven't invested money for serious threats like the, you know, pandemic. You know, we don't, we don't have, we destroy, in, in my country, we have been fighting in Afghanistan. We have been in Afghanistan since 2001. And uh, at the same time, we were cutting hospitals, we were cutting health resources, while at the same time fighting this war in Afghanistan, which basically, is barely reported in the press, and the last time we we work in depth on this war was only thanks to the Afghan war logs published by WikiLeaks. So there is a link between this situation, this the scarcity of resources for this pandemic, for example, and these national security policies. We focus on enemies that never were while at the same time never focusing on the real threats like the pandemic and the, the, the collapse of our health infrastructures, the resources for health. So there is a link. This is a, also one of the reasons why we are in such bad situation right now. I mean, our hospitals are in huge crisis. Why? Because we cut and cut and cut while at the same time we were investing money for uh, the JFS Lockheed Martin uh, uh, fighters and we were investing money for Afghanistan. And if you read, read the cables, you see the pressures on Italian authorities, for example, which are the very same pressures on other authorities, not unique. My country, Italy, is not unique. They were putting pressure for extraordinary rendition on my country. They were putting pressure for um, not making the CIA agents accountable for in uh, Germany for the uh, Khaled al Masri case. So if you get the case, you, you access the cables, and we can do this only thanks to the fact that WikiLeaks published them. They did not share, just share with the journalists, but they made available to everyone. So that 10 years later, you can go there and access the documents no matter who you are, whether you are a journalist or whether you are a scholar, or whether you are uh, whoever you are, you know, and you can make sense of this decision. I mean, 10 years later, I'm able to make sense of the decision of my politicians just because I know I'm able to access their their mind, their read, them, read their minds and understand how they approach the US, how the US approach the Italian politicians or the German politicians or the French politician or the, you know, the Guatemalan politicians because we have these cables, you know? So it's it's not just about the national security complex in the sense that uh, torture um, or, or in the sense of that wars, but it's also about the, the, the policies, looking at the ability to understand the policies as they are relevant, you know? Because the freedom of information, the knowledge, the the democratic access to the to the, the this knowledge doesn't it's not possible if you have access 30 years later it doesn't make sense i mean 30 years later you don't you cannot do anything as a citizen with this kind of information so the freedom of information act when you when it allows you to access information which goes back to 40 years ago i mean of course, it's uh, relevant for a scholar, for uh, an historian, and so on. But it's not relevant for, you know, understanding our democracies and uh, addressing what is wrong. You know, 
So that's why this, this kind of approach of publishing information as they are relevant is crucial. I mean, and how, I mean, how we ended up in this um, situation right now with this pandemic, we, because we focus on mad, mad anti-terror policies going after enemies that never were, while not addressing real threats to our societies and our uh, uh, democracy. I mean, we don't have a hospital able to manage this pandemic. We had, why not? Because we invested money for enemies that never were, you know? And we did so because we were under pressure. So we are able to get, go back and get evidence of these pressures, you know, from the US to the Italian politicians and to the Italian uh, national security complex and military complex, you know. So we are able to understand this only thanks to these documents. That's why the, these, uh, these documents are a treasure. They, are, uh, they really allow you to establish accountability, you know of these people, of these, of these politicians and these powerful entities. I, I am so pleased to have been part of this conversation. I feel like we've, you know, as usual, we've touched on just a little bit. I was very interested uh, when Stefania said, and me not being a journalist, about how the information is still the treasure trove. But if you talk to me with a kind of sense of an historical or academic side, of course, <laughs> it continues to be a valid uh, data set that we need to look at. A couple of just roundup thoughts, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. But a couple of things that, that occurred to me when you were talking about, we have this national security um, overreach that we were dealing with for the last 20 years and has been coming up, uh, certainly Snowden revelations and what, and what um, WikiLeaks have done brought that to the fore, probably raising that awareness, not necessarily general public, although the ideas of personalities were interesting to the public. Snowden was an interesting character for, for the public. But we also had out of that the global principles on, of, on national security and access to information. So I do recommend people go back and look at that. The, they were called the, the Shwani principles. Um, national security is one of those things that people don't feel often is re totally related to them or they trust their governments to deal with. Climate change, another one that we see when we have our storms and our flooding and our heat waves in Glasgow, um, but we don't necessarily see it. It feels like it's not as, as connected. COVID brought everybody to the same place at the same point and brought, brought these issues into our living rooms and into our apartments and into our lives. And, and there's been great death and destruction of humans. And we know if we go back up that scale, we go from COVID back to climate crisis and overuse and exploitation of resources back up to national security overreach and how we're actually balancing this out. They are connected. We're interconnected. Felicity brought up um, issues around Aboriginal peoples. You know, this, we are our planet. We're getting, I think, a bit of a of a push to understand that and we're having to have huge crises in our in our houses to understand that but it's about bloody time we did and this panel has been just incredible to listen to and make some of those connections there's so much to do there's so much to explore and examine but to get out there and there's immediate crises or immediate ways we can make things better and it is to not go after one person to hold all the responsibility uh, as Julian Assange seems to be left with for being on the edge of what was going to happen anyway, a revolution in technology and a fight over information. We need it and we need journalists and we need publishers. So I hope that this has really helped people think about these issues perhaps in different ways than they had previously. So I'm gonna hand over to Tatiana, who's going to, um, I think, see if there's some questions from the audience. Um, and those will be for the speakers to pick up and I'm happy to make comments if and when needed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna, and also thanks to all the speakers. This was a very important uh, panel. Uh, there are actually quite a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, um, I'm going to read the first one uh, that is related to the grand jury investigation. Um, and people are also mentioning that uh, Assange at the end uh, uh, was not so parado paranoid to fear the extradition and also uh, trying to seek asylum at the Ecuador embassy. 
Um, and uh, uh, related to that, there is a question uh, uh, to the case of uh, Chelsea Manning, um, and uh, uh, the person is asking, Chelsea Manning had to suffer harsh imprisonment for refusing to testify against Assange. Was her sacrifice worth it, and does it make any difference? So I would ask if perhaps you could specify a bit more about the grand jury investigation that also we know goes back a long time, and also uh, specifically uh, answer to this question related to the Chelsea Manning refusal to testify against Assange. Sulet, do you want to start with that one? Yes. Um, so I think it's made, I mean, it's, you know, made a very big impact um, because it's a very principled stand. She's behaved in a very principled way, um, saying, I am not going to take part in this kangaroo court um, of, of prosecution of a publisher. Um, now, she went underwent incredible hardship, um, uh, so much so that President Obama um, eventually, you know, stopped um, her time in prison and um, released her uh, because it was recognized how badly she had been um, treated, you know, being put, being penalized in the pre prison system and put in solitary confinement because your toothpaste had expired. Really? Um, and so, so I think that her, her willingness to, um, go back into incarceration um, by refusing to partake in the system is an incredibly brave stance, but importantly, you know, courage is contagious. It is something that, that Julian often says. And her courage in that is contagious to other people who are facing um, attacks. So let's be clear, the attack on the whistleblower has in most recent years, expanded. We're now seeing attacks on the lawyers of whistleblowers, the families of whistleblowers, the journalist and the publisher, as we see it is, and the technologist, the Olabini case in Ecuador. So the, the computer programmer now. So in a sense, Chelsea's willingness sends a message to all of not just whistleblowers, but also to the people around them to stand strong and firm. Uh, and, and there is camaraderie in that, but gee, it's at a very high price. I mean, I think I really do wonder in so many ways whether this view really represents what most Americans think. In cybersecurity, you know, there are two trains of thoughts. You can put software out there that is um, hidden and you, you hide the security flaws and you hope by making it obscure, no one will find them and the, and the software will be found or you open it up, you let everybody critique it, you apply the principles of an open society to it, and by that you make it more robust. That's what journalism does, what publishing does, what whistleblowers do, what an open society does, and it actually makes a society more secure. Now, hopefully there are people in the security state who understand that and agree with it. Not everyone in the security state is, is necessarily against transparency and openly, openness. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so I think that what she has done is a very principled thing and it sends a message to the rest of the community that's very valuable. I would agree 100 percent. I mean, grand juries are secret and they're absolutely corrosive to the rule of law. Um, grand juries only exist in the US and in Liberia and no <laughs> judges are present. Jurors are not screened for bias and rules of evidence doesn't apply and there are no, there's no right to remain silent. So Chelsea's position was regarding how just horrendous, what a quantum leap backwards grand juries actually are in terms of rule of law, um, but also was taking a principled stand that her testimony held from her enormously detailed court case um, I think Chelsea Manning is someone of quite small stature, but is a giant in terms of what she has withstood and what she has endured and why she has done that. I feel so inspired by that individual, but so does so many others in that 
the thousands of dollars a day she was being fined by refusing to participate in the grand jury was raised within 24 hours or 36 hours of her release. Um, the community f fell to her uh, to support um, and to remove that pressure of debt. Um, and it was testament to that there wasn't going to be no um, kind of, it wasn't, she wasn't going to be punished because she had so much solidarity, so much support. And I feel that that it's, it's not just sort of insiders or, um, uh, or, or people in a small circle, but a very, very broad awareness of what a giant Chelsea Manning truly is. There is actually another question related to many, but not only. Um, any idea of uh, how many around Assange have been pressured and threatened by the US investigation? Stefania, do you would know? Be do you want to, to quantify? <laughs> I think it would be difficult to quantify. But Stefania, yeah. jump in. No, no, it's difficult, as he said. It's a very difficult because it, it being a secret process, you know, where and being so intimidating, uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to map how many have been approached, how many have been offered immunity, uh, which means they were put, they were pressured to, you know, to become informant, basically. So it's a really really difficult but these intimidation tactics are um, you know uh, are common i mean if you think we have been spied inside the embassy and probably all our you know belongings and electronic uh, devices have been spied that's something you know something big and probably they have done this to to get information for the U.S. investigation is very likely. I mean, I'm, I'm happy that at the end of the day I was able to <clears throat> to file a criminal complaint because I want to some kind of factual information and I want an investigation by the Spanish authorities on this uh, security company, uh, UC Global, and you know, but this is part of this pattern of uh, uh, people people being approached, try to uh, you know be intimidated and convinced to to drop the their work, their uh, support for Julian Assange of WikiLeaks and to make them realize that they are risking and they risk ending up in this investigate in this US investigation for alleged uh, violations of the espionage act which is i mean something very i mean i i have known people who have been destroyed um, by the espionage act uh, they have been bankrupt uh, they have been you know so uh, People are scared, and this is a you know an intimidation technique, and this is a way to send a message: don't mess up with us, because you will end up in this investigation, and your lives will be destroyed. You know. Okay, and <clears throat> there is another question. Uh, we are asked to write to our political uh, representatives, but uh, due to the separation of powers, I'm unsure what they can do. Can someone explain how a minister or a foreign government can influence the outcome of this case? Felicity, do you want to jump in? Okay. Having yeah, been I in a parliament? I can try and answer that because <laughs> This is a this is a profoundly political case, and so um, one of the main arguments by Julian's defence team at the evidentiary hearing was just how political this case is, and it's not going to necessarily um, be resolved on a legal level alone. So by engaging your political um, representatives. Uh, in Australia, we're encouraging people to ask their political representatives, are you a member of the Bring Us Home parliamentary group? If not, why not? And would you please ask the foreign minister to pick up the phone and say to the Biden administration, hey, 
when you were the vice president, Mr. Biden, you decided to not go ahead with this prosecution because of the New York Times problem. Uh, it remains a problem. And it was Trump overreach and prosecutorial zealousness um, that has brought the case to this point. And it's time for it to stop. It's time for this to be over. Um, and we feel that that's a, an approach that that's that's legit and all that work. The new Attorney General has like really quite a lot on his plate, and um, this is a this is an old matter that has festered, and has the likelihood in the relationship between America and Australia to oh, become I think your Australian is voice a bit. and grow louder. Um, that is why. Okay. I'll... Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but was breaking a bit your connection. Let's hope uh, won't be too bad. Um, maybe I can go uh, on can with I the just, next question. Uh, yes, but I wouldn't mind just jumping in one, one second, just as uh, just um, from the point of view of of being a lawyer. You know, the the separation of powers is important, but it's no law should be done in a vacuum. And and I think that the thing about making it clear that these court cases are being watched, that they are important, that the that the if you're writing to your parliamentarians or you're making public statements, you're making sure in the same way that a criminal um, defense lawyer will hold power to account for how uh, they go after people, not just the fact that that uh, they do go after, but using using um, justice and and properly you know they have so much weight of power in their hands that you hold them to account of how they exercise that and it's so important that that politicians that the public raise their voices to say this matters to us and we expect you to do it right and it does hold them to a higher standard than perhaps they would do in a secret court like the grand jury where all all of these rules don't seem to apply because actually nobody's there to really watch it and say hold on a second here um so in all cases even if you agree, and I'm not using this as any type of example with Julian Assange, but even if you think that the outcome of a case is right, how they get there is deeply important for all of our rights and all of our protections. So parliamentarians have a great deal to do with at least speaking up and the politics of it to make it quite clear that this going on causes more damage to the legal system as much as it does to uh, a, a, an individual person. I just wanted to throw that out there. So I saw I you a, were um, saying yes, do you really want good. to add something? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a really good case study in this is John Kiriakou, the ex-CIA officer uh, who revealed torture being conducted on prisoners held by the CIA. And he campaigned for a number of years, when, both from prison and then out of prison, to get U.S. policies changed on torturing. Uh, and, and he did that by doing things like going to the psychologists association and getting them to pass policy yeah. decisions that say you don't get to be an honorable member of this esteemed society if you are engaged in supporting psychological or you know torture in any fashion uh, of prisoners and and so it's the same thing with professions as you say spot on anna um absolutely spot on you know professionals they don't want to see their profession degraded by dirty ethical behavior. It goes against the grain. Um, and so I think one way to have an impact is to reach out to those organizations, as you say, that have a perhaps a big voice because they're a group of people, represent a profession and, and ask them to sign on board to saying, please drop the charges against Julian Assange. But even if you can't do that, even if you're just watching this discussion here today, a letter, an email to the White House, to your local representative um, in whatever country you're in, asking them to please send a letter to the president saying, drop this case. It's There's no need to go on with this. And it sends a bad message. Um, those things can make a difference. And, and people, I think also it's good on another level. It empowers people because they feel like in some small way they're a part of this discussion. And we want them to feel that way. There are checks and balances on our society. So if they feel silenced, they won't be doing that role. Thank you. Um, 
There is also another question uh, uh, in the audience. They also would like to know more about the current situation of Julian in prison. I mean, we know that uh, through uh, the pandemic, uh, um, there have been the situation then uh, uh, visitations were banned. Uh, there was a high uh, degree of social distance uh, and also isolation. Uh, could you tell a bit more of what he's experiencing at the moment? And then also there was a question for Jennifer, but maybe others can answer. Uh, when can we expect the judge decision for appeal to become public? So regarding so the last question, um, does my internet work? Yes. Shall I try? Yes. Yes. Um, Regarding, regarding the dates for the court process, so as you know, on the 4th of January this year, the judge issued the decision and then two days later um, decided to not let Julian be bailed. And so he remains in Belmarsh Prison, which seems insane because, because of her decision, the UK was basically the only jurisdiction that he would be safe. Um, he, he was not to be extradited from the UK, so his motivation to to flee the UK would be would be completely insane. So that was a terrible decision. So the US have issued their appeal; they've lodged their documents of appeal, and the defence uh, team has until the 29th of March to put in their rebuttal of that. And then it will be a few days, a few weeks after that, that the judges uh, of the High Court will decide whether they will agree to hear the matter. And they usually do, apparently. Um, if they decide against it, if the higher court says, no, the lower court has actually got this right, we don't see grounds for appeal, they, then Julian walks free. If the High Court judge says, okay, yes, let's hear it and have it out, that could be months. And if the um, appeal is won, then it would be, uh, by the US, it would be appealed again to a higher court, the Supreme Court, and then potentially the European Court. And then we're looking at years of him being in that dungeon, that very wire, razor wire, concrete, hideous deprivation of, of any humanity, um, loud, clanging, traumatic, traumatic, awful place, Belmarsh Prison. Um, I understand that he is kept in a cell for 23 and a half hours a day and that he gets exercise um, in, in a completely concrete yard um, where there is, like, someone's attempted a joke, you know, enjoy the green grass beneath your feet, and there is no green grass anywhere to be seen. Um, that's what I understand his situation is, that there's been COVID in the prison, among the prison population, but also among the um, prison staff population, that there's been COVID in his ward, like in on his cell block. Um, and Julian has a chronic lung condition. So I'm just like beside myself with worry every day that he's there. Um, particularly because there's no need for him to be there. He has a family, he has children who need him. Uh, he's an extremely famous human being uh, who, would, who, who, who has no incentive to flee. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's what I have to say. We should just add that this whole time, in fact, for almost coming on two years, he's been sitting in this maximum security prison, no crime, no convicted crime, He's literally just sitting in there with no crime against him. That's an extraordinary thing. You, you would normally not do that for uh, for someone who's facing, you know, bail extradition. And and as I understand it, the first symptom you show in that prison, you get sent off to the COVID ward. And you can imagine if you're in the COVID ward that you can be assured of getting COVID. And if you go to make a phone call, to use a facility to make a phone call in the prison, they're not wiped down between the prisoners. Alcohol is not, you know, we go into a hospital or a public building, 
There, there are squirt bottles everywhere of disinfectant. That doesn't exist in the prison. That's not an option. So it, it really is a diabolical situation. Thank you. And can uh, I just, there can is, I just uh, add one, one short thing? Yes. Can I just add? So uh, today is the, I mean, just to, to make you realize, because um, in this conversation, we, <clears throat> We refer to the fact that people maybe have uh, difficulty in understanding the how national security relates to their lives because you know especially people who never had this um, uh, any experience with the national security complex and so on. And just to close this um, wonderful <clears throat> panel, uh, today is the 18th anniversary of the Iraq War. And Julian Assange has always told me, and I think I'm not the only one, I, he probably told this kind of things to many others, that Ad WikiLeaks existed back in 2003 when uh, the Iraq war was uh, started. Probably uh, we would not have this uh, massacre, these um, uh, killings of millions of people, uh, refugees, and so on. Uh, so you have to realize that as we speak, uh, these criminals, these war criminals, these torturers are completely free, whereas the, the person who exposed them is in a maximum security prison. So, you know, it doesn't take you to understand the national security or complex things to realize the injustice of all this and how this injustice impact on everyone's life. It doesn't take uh, being a national security reporter or a national security expert or a scholar. Just think about this. Today is the 18th anniversary. These people killed millions, uh, put, uh, I mean, destroyed the, country and millions of lives and they are completely free and these men who reveal these war crimes who re who allowed to reveal 15,000 deaths of civilians in Iraq never accounted before is in a maximum security prison and he is kill is ending in la in prison for life so i think everyone is able to understand that uh, this massive injustice, how, I mean, do we want a so society like this? Do we want a society where uh, those who are war criminals who kill millions and make millions refugees are completely free above the law and the person who exposed them is in prison and are ending in prison for life? So it is about what kind of society you want. It doesn't take that you understand the national security or complex things. It is all about this. It's very easy to understand. Who are you siding with? You know? Thank you, Stefania. And uh, with that, I would like to close with the last question that I think uh, gives also perhaps a bit of hope. Uh, somebody is asking what uh, else can be done to help this case. and. Uh, feel like there has been demos and action for so many years. Um, they would like to hear uh, what action are most helpful at the moment. Uh, we know also about the recent uh, right uh, uh, to protest uh, uh, limitation. Uh, so let's try to also understand uh, what people can do uh, as a network of support. Uh, what can we do to help Julian um, as a community also that believe in certain actions. So, come on, jump in. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Inform yourself uh, and protest. And, you know, don't stay silent, you know, protest and whatever you can do and speak out, you know, and write emails to newsrooms to reporters and so on you know if fine, i can just jump in and yeah sorry fine. i was just going to say with, with, okay. with this panel we have 
Sulet, who kind of covers, crosses the barriers between, um, or crosses professional bodies between academic and, and NGO and support. Stefania, journalism and understanding the public interest and being active in protecting the public interest in ways that aren't just about reporting. She's using the law. She's out there speaking. We have Felicity, who has this experience at an international level with human rights and women's rights and at a, at a national parliamentary level entering academia. The Whistleblowing International Network brings together NGOs that all have a have a commonality of working to defend and protect whistleblowers, but from many different perspectives, whether it's journalists, human rights, um, uh, and, and academics, and politicians. So you can see that the world that we're inhabiting, we're, we are standing together in a way that perhaps when things were calmer, whether they were really calm or not ever, is a debate, but where we were perhaps getting siloed and we were we were in our uh, little areas kind of trying to understand each other, um, maybe not always understanding each other. I think right now, I know I want good journalism, journalists to do good journalism, and I don't need to be that, but I need to support the space in which they are able to do that. Um, and, and I, am, as a lawyer, want to make sure that lawyers are, are speaking up and using the law in the way that it's intended, which is to hold power to account, not to protect the interests of power. So we've got anti-slap groups starting, which are the suits and lawsuits that every powerful person will take against whistleblowers, journalists, and academics and NGOs. We've got it, academics really probing these areas, and Felicity is one who's done that, bringing all of this together and really um, uh, doing a PhD and doing books while she's doing a PhD. PhD, um, editing, bringing together those voices. So we are standing together and you are part of it, you know, and there's lots of organizations which you can support individually or together, but but this is raising each other's voices up. Uh, Felicity and Sulet, I certainly leave the last words to you. I'll leave the last um, word to Felicity. I think that and if you can you. always, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say, if you wanna read up on the case, um, the Bridges for Media Freedom, which is Blueprint for Free Speech project uh, run by Naomi Colvin, has um, reporting from every day of the court cases. So we had, you know, a professional journalist in the courtroom, either virtually or physically, covering it day by day. And there is also pictures from outside the courtroom. Obviously, you can't take pictures from inside. But if you're not familiar with the case, that's a really good um, site to go to, to 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 do it. And And in a sense, I think, you know, what we've tried to do that is what I think everyone should try to do, which is bring this case to light. Don't let it be swept under the carpet. Tweet it, social media it, write about it, um, send letters in to people. It doesn't matter if it's a handwritten letter. Sometimes a handwritten letter has the most impact, actually. Um, and, and those even small acts, even a retweet with a comment um, and, and an et, you know, a prime minister, a president, a White House, all of those things matter. And it could take just five minutes. So you are, you are welcome, invited and empowered to step in and play a role in changing this injustice. Felicity, yes, I agree you with to... Solette. Um, yes, um, I think what Solette has said is, is exactly right. Um, everybody has a role to play here particularly before the 29th of, um, of March. But, um, you know, pressure on Merrick Garland now to, like, to, to make these, 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 um, uh, this overreach and this excessive um, uh, prosecutorial um, zealous, zealousness kind of go away would be great. Um, of course, you can always support financially as well the Courage Foundation. Um, that there's a, it's quite expensive to run these legal cases and to, to, to run campaigns like the Don't Extradite Assange campaign and the various efforts here in Australia. Um, I've been noticing how powerful very small actions can be, um, chalking on, on, on roads and sidewalks. Um, in Australia, more and more people are tying yellow ribbons to trees, which is something that I see in the US done, but it's being done here for Julian, and it's really... Um, they're everywhere. Everywhere I go, I see them. So uh, wearing a T-shirt boldly and walking around um, is also good. So you can always uh, go to the WikiLeaks shop and, and buy a T-shirt. So it's it's in bold, small ways, but also uh, coming together. There's groups all around the world um, and definitely where you are, um, you'll be able to find 
groups who were t- who were taking action, who were doing vigils, and who were um, writing letters and going and visiting politicians and organising events and opportunities for people to learn. So uh, uh, small actions, large actions, imaginative actions, bold actions, actions now and before the 29th of March, but uh, ongoing. Thank you. So we arrive now at the time of closing the panel, and I think actually this panel has been already also an action of support, I would say. I really have to thank you for being with us, and also I want to thank the community that supported this panel, because uh, we have been a lot of people really sharing what we are doing here and also uh, promoting this conversation. So I could see that uh, there is a lot of support uh, from the community around Julian Assange, and this is very important. And we always have to remember that he's not alone, at least uh, from our side. So thank you very much, uh, Sulet, uh, Jennifer, Stefania, Felicity, and Anna. This was really a great conversation. We will also uh, spread it as much as we can. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, I am now introducing what uh, will up, uh, ne happen next uh, today. Uh, we will have a workshop uh, uh, from our community program with uh, Serena Tinari, uh, Gets Your Number Straight, Making Sense of Health Data. Uh, this will start at 3 until 5, it's still possible to um, be part of it if you want, uh, so we welcome to also register if you can. Um, then I also remember that uh, it's still possible until uh, Sunday to watch uh, for free in Germany the film Coronation uh, uh, by Ai Weiwei. Um, it's uh, possible to reach it through our website, also there you have to get the tickets, but it's for free. Uh, so please, if you are in Germany, you can do it until Sunday evening. And then uh, our next uh, live event will be next Friday, um, will be our uh, number 20 Disruptive Fridays about the global consequences of COVID-19, uh, will be on March 26 at 5 p.m. Berlin time. And uh, together with us, uh, we will have uh, Jacqueline Klob, that is the co-director of the Center for Sustainable Urban Development uh, at Columbia University. Uh, Madeline Davis, the global health correspondent uh, at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. And Ido Fock, that is uh, uh, writing for the new statement. Uh, the moderator will be Alana Travers. Uh, at the end, I really would like also to thank the team of the Disruption Network Club that have been doing this great conference because we have to say this is our last uh, event uh, of uh, the day, uh, except the workshop, of course, but it's the last live event. So thank you very much, Lieke Plucher, the co-director of the Disruption Network Club, Elena Velianoska and Nada Bakker that have been working on the production, Jonas Franchi on the graphic, Alana Travers on the communication, Claudia Trapp on the press, um, Francesco Mancori on the lights, uh, Lauren De Carli on the report, and uh, the Boiling Head streaming team for providing us this great platform that we are currently using. So thank you very much, and thanks for this really important and great conversation.